احب ارحب بالساده الحضور ونأسف ان احنا بنبتدي الندوه متاخرين عن المعتاد لان كان بتسبق الندوه ندوه اخرى قدمتها الاستاذه ميرفا تبعوف عن الاخلاقيات في مجال الاعلام. وبنرحب بيكم للجلسة جديدة وحوار جديد من حوارات التحرير تحرير دايلوكس والندوة النهاردة هتتم باللغة الإنجليزية عندنا كوكبة متميزة جدا من أساتذة الاقتصاد والسياسات العامة من جامعات هارفارد وأكسفورد ومن الجامعة الأمريكية بالقاهرة ومتهزنا فرصة وجودهم في مصر لتنظيم هذه الندوة من ندوات حوار التحرير في ترجمة فورية متوفرة اللي هيحتاج ترجمة لأن الندوة هتتم باللغة الإنجليزية هقدم السادة الضيوف باختصار وبعدين هترك المجال لزميلي الدكتور محمد العساس عميد مشارك للشؤون البكالوريوس وال وال اوتريتش وحاجات تانية <تصفيق> 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 للانشطة العملية للانشطة العملية يستكمل الحوار ويديره مع السادة الضيوف معنا دكتور اسحاق ديوان ودكتور اسحاق از بروفيسور اند فيلو ات هارفارد كينيدي سكول اند دايركتور اوف ذا بوليتيكال ايكونومي بروجرام ات ذا ايكونومكس ريسيرش فورم اي ار اف ان ايجيبت وي هاف اولسو دكتور اديل مالك He's a university research lecturer in development economics at Oxford University and the Globe Fellow in the Economies of Muslim Societies at the Oxford Center for Islamic Studies. We have uh, our own Dr. Samer Atalla, Assistant Professor of Economics, School of Business, American University in Cairo, and Dr. Mohammed Al Isais, Associate Dean of Administration, Undergraduate Studies and Public Outreach, School of Global and Public Policy going to moderate the discussion. The discussion is going to be about the rentier state uh, and the uh, examples I think will be uh, about Arab countries and about Egypt. We will have them talk for a while and then the floor will be open for questions and answers uh, to the floor. Thank you very much and I pass the mic to uh, Dr. Elisais. Thank you. Um. Thank you, Dr. Layla. Um, uh, it's, it's really uh, a true pleasure to, to, to be sitting next to, uh, to these giants next to me uh, in, in, in this field. Um, uh, old friends, new friends, soon to be friends. Um, <laughs> um, the topic of today is, is focused on rentier states. Um, Rentier states refer to those states um, which accrue a large sum of their income directly from foreign sources, uh, be it uh, oil, as, uh, as is the main player in the region, uh, be it uh, other sources of foreign income, such as foreign aid, um, such as uh, you know, um, uh, other natural resources, and these resources and income usually goes directly to the government. That changes the, the fundamental relationship between the governed and the governing. Because usually that relationship is one where we collect taxes from you to run the economy and therefore we represent you. And that fundamental change whereby the state does not need uh, the money of its own people fundamentally changes the social contract changes the economy and changes that relationship. So uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, that relationship in general as it pertains specifically to the Arab world. It's a very timely period to be discussing this. Oil prices, the, 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 the lifeline of the region, has dropped 25% in the past four months from $115 per barrel to $85. That has a direct and serious impact on the economies of the region and other economies. So we're going to be starting the talk uh, with Adil, uh, where he's going to be touching upon that relationship between the state and the private sector, and then we we'll move on. Adil, please. Well, thank you very much. I'm extremely delighted to be here. Uh, it's my first visit to the Medical University of Cairo. Um, and as a student 
uh, was continuing to learn and study in the Middle East, uh, the American University of Cairo, the American University of Bangladesh, these are clearly leading institutions. I'm going to be talking about um, the state business relationship, and my basic hypothesis is the following. If we want to redefine the political economy of the Middle East, if we want to refashion the political economy of the Middle East, it requires reimagining the ruler merchant relationship or the state business relationship. The turmoil that we have seen in the region and that continues to afflict the region is clearly a development failure. It signifies the fact that the old development model that the Arab world has followed for long periods of time has failed, has reached its expired date. And in fact, one could say that we have already set the passing rights of that development model. The crisis we have seen and that we continue to witness is really not just a crisis about the Arab state, its ability to reform, redistribute, represent ordinary uh, Arabs' interests. It's also a crisis of the private sector, or more appropriately, its absence. Because all through the region, we have a private sector with, of course, remarkable differences between the GCC and other states, but the private sector is largely an appendage of the state. It's not truly genuinely independent. And I think that without an autonomous private sector, you cannot create new political commons. Of course, there's a big employment issue here. You know, 300,000 Saudi graduates are being added to the labor market every year. And the crisis we've seen in Egypt is very clear from one of our colleagues, Rabi Assad's paper, where he shows how over the last 40 years, the share of government wage workers has dramatically declined to about 70% to now uh, 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 a little above 20%. Now that fall in government employment was not picked up by the private sector. It was the informal sector that picked up that employment slack. And that brings me to the real question about how to create that private sector that would create jobs for the Cayman millions. And my main hypothesis is that the private sector development is not just about improving you know, uh, investment climate, reducing the cost of doing business. A lot of what the World Bank has focused on is right. Those are the right constraints. They need credit. They need better investment environment. But the private sector development is a challenge that is in part political and that is in part regional. It's political because for much of the Middle Eastern history, rulers have viewed the private sector as a threat, independent merchants as a threat. The merchants have been feared rather than favored in, in the Arab world. And so it's in part a political issue. Unless you generate a private sector that generates independent income streams that are independent of the networks of patronage that the state controls, you're unlikely to create a new constituency for political and economic reform. It's also a real challenge because without regional markets that are connected with each other, without economic commons, you're unlikely to see a private sector that really thrives on its own. So let me first begin with the politics. Clearly, in large parts of, of, of the Middle East, the private sector landscape is defined by privilege, not competition. It, it is in fact a pyramid of privilege where there are few firms at the top and a lot of informal se sector firms at the bottom. And what we see in the, in the Middle East is really the economics of concessions trumps the economics of competition through monopolies, through licenses, through a whole range of trade frictions, trade barriers that act as entry barriers for new firms. Now these generate rents, what economists call unearned income streams. And these are not, unlike what Muhammad is saying, these are not foreign uh, uh, derived rents, externally derived rents. These are rents that are generated from the manipulation of the economy. And these rents are not just what the World Bank would argue, just uh, uh, change regulation from here to there. They're actually rents that are used to create elite coalitions. They're used to manage the coalitions. And therefore, if you create a competitive space for the private sector, it has to come out as a political concession. 
without a political concession, we are not going to create a space for the private sector development. In other words, there is a clear trade-off today in the Arab world between employment and autonomy. If you want to generate employment for the people, you have to give more autonomy to the private sector. You cannot have both. Now, let me begin, uh, address the second issue, which is vision uh, integration, which I think is hugely important. For a long time, you know, regional markets have remained divided. And of course, they have remained divided in part because those who control the markets derive rents from them. But they're also divided because the infrastructure for connection is hugely weak. You know, the Arab world is divided, is fragmented into several little units. And that deprives the firms from the economies of scale. But it also restricts deeper trade reforms. And therefore, what is important is to gradually remove those barriers, to create a space where the private sector could develop. Now, of course, it's not a very feasible thing to say it in these times. But I think as scholars, we have to be honest in making our assessment and at least pinpoint the constraints that may not be very feasible but are still very desirable. And I think what the region needs today are regional economic commons because without those, you do not create new ladders for prosperity. And the example is everywhere. Turkey's growth is through regional linkages. Southeast Asian growth is through regional supply chains. Unless you, create, you connect these markets, you do not create a vibrant merchant community that does not look at the state for favors, that looks at the market. One reason why Erdogan and his party were able to see eye to eye to the entrenched state in Turkey was because they could look towards the sea. They could look towards the, the trade. And those new trade patterns created new politics. So unless there is a fundamental realignment of existing trade relations in the Arab world, New politics is difficult to generate. Let me then end by talking about a new logic for reform in the Arab world. And it should be a logic that really should center around bringing people from the margins to the mainstream. For a long time, we've had discussion about who is on the left, who is on the right. In fact, private sector development is the most despised element of reform. It's also the most desirable aspect for reform. It's the most despised aspect because ordinary Arabs, even the informal sector firms, see no difference between business and rulers. They see them as growing capitalists. But it's also the most desirable aspect for reform because without a genuine private sector, you're not likely to create the incomes that will create new politics. And in creating that space, the important thing for reform has to be to bring people from the margins to the mainstream. And when you think about bringing people from the margins to the mainstream, remember that reform in the Arab world has been a centralizing instrument. Let me give you three examples from this country. Over the last 200 years, there were three major reform episodes. There were the Tanzimat reforms around the 1836, the huge bureaucratic reorganization. Then you had the nationalist period under Nasser land reforms, greater role of the state, nationalization of the private sector. Then you had Sadat and Mubarak who created the period of infita, economic opening. Now these three reform episodes spread over 200 years are very different. The first one was bureaucratic reorganization. The second one was greater role of the state. The third one was partial withdrawal. But as an institutional economist, I see all three reform episodes as part of the same institutional continuum in the sense that in each case, reform centralized power. It refurbished the power of the state. So those who came talking about Arab nationalism, it was an ideological tool because the nationalist movement strengthened the state at the expense of the private sector. You know, for, a, for a while, people, the merchants who were supporting the idea of the United Arab Republic where there were several members of the Arab world who came together, the first thing nationalist leaders did was to sever the trade connections. And even today, Bashar al-Assad is uh, fighting in Aleppo more, because that's where the merchant constituency is concentrated. Therefore, one can argue that any reform that again is a centripetal or a centrifugal force, that is going to be a key driver of outcomes. Now, we've seen a, a very difficult situation in the region where many people are saying there may be a, 
uh, you know, a, a, a revision of the sykes picot agreement, I think a thousand lines can be drawn on the sand. But that will not change the fundamental economic reality of this uh, part of the world, which is job creation, realignment of the rural merchant relationship. And that realignment would require a concession both from the political elites mm. at home as well as global powers, because both benefit by dividing the region, by dividing the private sector. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very interesting, and I'm sure we'll solicit a lot of debate afterwards. Um, next is uh, Professor Isha, um, a friend, a colleague, and a mentor who's done, uh, I've been privy to see some of his work on uh, on on, uh, on crony economies and on the interplay between, um, between the level of natural resources that a country accrues and how that changes the fundamentals of its social contract. Dr. Ishaq. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, I'm very honored to, to be here. Uh, and I won't be speaking too much about chronism tonight. <coughs> I want to uh, very much complement uh, the analysis of Adil, uh, very much focusing really on, her, on his first point, which is that uh, the, the type of state business relation, as, as we see it emerging in different countries of the region and how performant the private sector is, very much depends on, on the social contract or what uh, political scientists call the political settlements. Uh, and maybe I want to go beyond the simple idea that rents uh, affect elite coalitions and, and, and lead to an here state. I want to have us think beyond that a little bit and beyond the notion that there's an average Arab and that oil is always a curse by uh, perhaps uh, uh, developing a little bit of a typology of, of, of the Arab state. So I, I want to maintain or to, to, I want to, uh, to, to put on the table, maybe caricaturing a little bit, that there are really three types of Arab states. Uh, there are the states that are very rich, that have a lot of oil per capita, and let's call them type one, you know, the GCC countries of this world. That, that, that have a political system that's very much patronage based, that is, uh, the, the ruler gave uh, sufficiently large transfers for everybody, to everybody, to everyone, uh, to, to, to basically uh, have them become uh, loyal citizens. And so uh, these are countries with little distributive fights, actually, and, and there are countries where rulers uh, are comfortable on their seats and can think long term and can think of developing the private sector. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, we have countries with, with relatively low uh, rents per capita or oil rents per capita in particular, oil per capita if you like, and these are by necessity competitive countries. There's no rulers that can buy everyone. Uh, it's, it's basically competitive and, and the rulers have to deliver economic growth to stay on and when there is a dif difficult patch they can repress a little bit and try to create some a little bit of rents, create rents, strategic rents or what we can call regulatory rents mm. is what you get out of chronism. Uh, but, but, but nevertheless ultimately these are competitive system where the private sector uh, has an important role to play. In type one, important role to play, the leader you know, doesn't have any misgivings about the private sector because there's really no opposition. In, in, in type three, the other side of, of the range, if you like, uh, the ruler is in the autocratic order, say pre-revolution, uh, is in an uncomfortable situation because they need economic growth, but uh, there is always a fear that uh, private, the private sector will finance the opposition. And, and so it's, it's, a, it's a much less comfortable position. I'll come back to this. And in the middle, we have a group, and so, you know, uh, type three, it's the Egypt and the Tunisia and the Lebanon of this world and Jordan and Morocco. Then we have type two, which are countries with oil, but with also lots of people. And so the, the oil rent, the oil per capita, the oil revenue per capita, are, are modest. Uh, they're, they're, they're average, 
it's, it's somewhere between say a thousand and five to ten thousand dollars if you like relative to the ten to fifty thousand for, for the rich countries <coughs> and, and, and here uh, these are the countries I would say where the oil curse has a real meaning because uh, you can't buy everyone and, and so you have patronage networks that focus on particular groups uh, and when, the, the, when there is more opposition, you have more repression, uh, the regime base could narrow. So, so there, there are really typically regimes, especially after the 80s, after uh, the first attempt at state-led growth, which had failed even though potentially, given that they had lots of people and lots of capital, we thought at that point that, that it was a good proposition, a promising proposition, but nevertheless, these are the regimes that failed everywhere. Iran, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Sudan, Algeria. Uh, and, and that increasingly had to rely on repression. It did not trust the private sector at all. There is no private sector in these countries because it's based on repression, but moreover, the ruler does not want any private sector. You know, at that most, they would have a cousin dominate all parts of the economy. So, what differentiates uh, these three ideal types, caricature type, if you like, uh, you could look at, uh, at governance indicators and you'd see that they are indeed very different in, in these three types of countries. Um, if you focus, for example, on five indicators, economic growth, uh, voice, how much voice, there is how much space for voice, uh, how much repression is used as an instrument for, 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 for governance, uh, how much capacity the government has, uh, and finally, how, how much uh, rule of law or lack of corruption there is. You would see uh, differences among these three groups of countries that you could possibly already guess if I explained uh, the technology correctly. So let me go quickly through each one of them economic growth, you would expect most growth in the type 1 countries. You know, they're the richest, they trust the private sector, and that's indeed what, what we have uh, seen over time. I mean, there was a literature about the also scarce in the 2000s when oil prices were low, but if you redo the calculations today, uh, at the second oil boom, uh, maybe it's heights. Uh, you would see that actually the countries of the GCC has, have grown at 6% a year on average over the past 50 years, which is more than middle income countries. And the second group in terms of growth are the competitive economies. The Egypt and the like over 50 years have grown at about 5%. It's the Iraqs of this world that have grown the least. At, at something like 3% a year. So, so pretty flat, so pretty much of a disaster given all the resources that they have. If you look at voice, you would see that type 3, uh, the, 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 the GCCs of this world, sorry, and the Iraqs of this world, types 1 and 2, there's no voice. Uh, that is, is extremely autocratic. On the other hand, the Egypt and Tunisia of this world that have to be more competitive because they have no choice, you know, even if you repress everyone, you will have an opposition hidden somewhere, have, have had actually no voice. But this has come down a little bit uh, before the, you know, the repression increased because economic growth wasn't doing so well in the 90s before, uh, before the, the, the uprisings. But, but, but nevertheless, there, there was more space uh, on, 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 on the political front. Uh, the repression, on the other hand, uh, is the lowest in the type 1 countries. There's no need for repression uh, in the Gulf. Patronage is the main instrument. Uh, of, of governance. It's the highest in the Iraqs of this world, as, as we said, and it's in the middle in, in the competitive states. And the competitive states, as I said, the predicament is when there is no growth, uh, you can't trust the private sector, it's, 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 a, it's a fragile situation, and, and, and you, you use repression once in a while, and that scares the private sector. Actually, when you get into this trajectory, you're literally going into the wall. Uh, and so, it's very important to be able to go and not to get sucked into, into this spiraling downward spiral that happened uh, before the uprising in many countries, possibly in part driven by, by the crisis, global crisis of 2008. Um, government capacity is, is, is very high, uh, 
in uh, the rentier states. So the tax argument is not always right. Some countries develop institutions not to tax people, but to spend their money. That is also a good reason to develop institutions. And the institutional framework is pretty rich in the GCC. It's, it's very poor in the Iraq of this world. The Sudi, the Mukhabarat are the main institutions, and it's average in the other countries. The rule of law is the best in the GCC. Uh, you know, the, the, the private sector uh, manages to have rules that stick because it doesn't scare, and the Mukhabarat don't have to breach the law very often. It's the worst in the Iraq of this world, and it's middle in, in, in the type two countries. Okay. Uh, another difference is the reaction to, to the Arab uh, uprisings. In type 1 countries, increased patronage. In type 3 countries, uh, the regimes lose out. They don't fire at demonstrators. In type 2 countries, the reaction of this world, civil wars. Uh, the, the regimes uh, cannot make a credible deal with the opposition. They have their, 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 their back to the world. Uh, they would be massacred, if you like. It's a very narrow coalition. They resist, actually. They are, they are, they are, they are very fierce. Uh, very quickly to conclude, what are the challenges, therefore, for private sector development are very different in the three types of countries. Uh, they fit boldly into, into what Adil said. It, it has to do with some kind of autonomy for the private sector, but within very different regimes. In, in type one country, in, in the GCC, the uh, the social contract is built around giving the private sector a lot of favors, including importing labor freely from anywhere they want in the, in the world at the lowest wages, and a lot of subsidies. That, of course, hurt national labor. It cannot work. It competes with the cheapest labor from around the world. And they are given another deal, which is you work for government and we give you lots of subsidies. As Demographic pressure increases, and there are more people. Oil per capita becomes smaller. Oil revenues are not growing as fast as the population. This deal increasingly becomes unsustainable. And there are two solutions: you have to give the businesses less, or you have to give the, the national labor, if you want less, or you can try to make the pie bigger by diversifying. And this is what the GCC is trying to do. They are trying to educate people to make them more efficient but also to tax foreign labor so that domestic labor can switch to become more productive in the private sector. Uh, I'm overboard, but I'll try to finish in one minute. Uh, now, this is, this is quite challenging, but, but, but the, 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 the way out is, is quite clear. But what we have to realize is that for the private sector to continue striving, we have to accept lower profit for the benefit of sustainability of the whole system and so for their benefit as a class in the future. Uh, in, in the type 2 countries, the Iraqs of this world, there is no hope for the private sector until these countries manage somehow to get a political settlement that works. And in the Egypt of this world, unfortunately I have no time to speak about it. <laughs> no, no, I will say, uh, I will say just one word. The challenge clearly is uh, to create, I mean, we are in the post-revolutionary chaos uh, that is starting to dissipate. You know, Egypt is really moving in different directions, but ultimately the challenge is the same, is to have more growth and therefore to have more private sector involvement. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there is no escape from the issue of uh, do I give more autonomy to the private sector so it can grow, or if not, do I rely much more on repression uh, to, 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 to keep uh, social peace and how sustainable that is? Very interesting, and, and it, 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 uh, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, presentation that uh, Isha gave, uh, there was a paper handout. You can see some of the data if you want that, uh, that he was referring to. Next is our own uh, economist, uh, Samar Atalla, uh, a close friend, a co-author, uh, and uh, he'll be tackling how do you manage in, in, in a fluctuating price world of, of natural resources of oil? How, how do you plan forward? What are the ramifications of, of that uh, vulnerability of, of, of prices? Samar. Good morning. 
So uh, I have, uh, I'll be uh, very precise uh, and uh, I'll tackle exactly uh, three main points uh, in my talk. Uh, the first point has to do with the current uh, energy market at large and the, the oil market uh, precisely. Now, uh, in, the, in the second half of 2014, there has been uh, a steady uh, decline in the price of oil. Uh, starting late June up till now, we've seen a drop of about 25% um, in the price of oil. Uh, and that is substantial. There are lot, uh, multiple uh, reasons. There are the usual suspects of uh, supply and demand. Uh, um, there is an increase in supply, mainly coming from the U.S. and Latin America, precisely Brazil. Um, there is also uh, uh, um, a demand that is not growing uh, sufficiently enough to keep the price of oil constant. Um, for multiple reasons, again, there is a slowdown in the Eurozone, which is the second largest uh, economy in the world. Um, and there is also uh, some um, uh, predictions of slowdown in the fast, fastest growing economies in the world, uh, namely China and India. Um, so the, the demand for uh, oil is still growing, but it's not growing as much in order to absorb the increased capacity in the world. Uh, that's the, 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 the initial assessment of the, um, of the why there is this decline in the oil price. But it could also be possible due to the fact that the, the historical relationship that we have between the global growth in the world economy and the price of oil has strongly changed. Um, you can make the argument that uh, the alternative energy is gaining momentum, uh, it's slow momentum, but it's still uh, posing itself as a possible alternative. Um, so the, the, maybe the, what we rely as economists as a structural relationship between uh, how fast the economy grows and how fast uh, the price of oil responds to this growth has many structural change. Uh, anyway, so the, we are now at a, an oil price of $85 per barrel, uh, as Mohammed mentioned earlier, starting, uh, which is a drop from about uh, 100 plus dollar per barrel, and this is a substantial reduction. Uh, so this is the starting point. This is my first point. In my, the second point is what are the implications of this on the, the Arab countries that are mainly exporting countries, the, the ones that uh, Mohammed referred to as the GCCs. Well, this is uh, um, a, a substantial drop in their surpluses. Uh, we estimate that they, they uh, there are estimates uh, that they may have a drop of uh, maybe uh, nearly $200 billion uh, in surpluses, so they're they're about, uh, they generate normally about $300 billion of surpluses per year. They project, if the prices keep on this trajectory, uh, to drop to about $100 billion. Uh, this is a small amount compared to how much they produce. Uh, not small, minimum, minimum small, but uh, it is still considered small, but it's substantial. It's substantial in order substantial enough to change the, the math of the decision making and, and to change the equation of what do we do with this money. Um, so, uh, and it's also uh, a new term from the, the, the last decade of piling up uh, surpluses and reserves that made uh, the oil exporting countries, the, the GCCs of this world, uh, uh, a, a large uh, economic and political power in the region. Uh, they were capable of uh, using their surpluses in order to have uh, a say in the uh, geopolitical situation in the world. And this obviously had implications during the Arab uprisings and the revolution. The GCC, the GCC countries had definitely a say in, uh, in this. Uh, some people speculate that the GCC uh, countries are having have do have a strategic interest in the lowering down of the or the, the downward trend of the price of oil because for them it um, 
it, in, in a way, if the price continues to uh, this downward trajectory, and there are estimates that it might fall up to seven, uh, down to $75 per barrel in the second half of 2015, it, it, uh, it kind of removes competition, it takes, it takes away competition from the market, and at a later stage, strategically, they will uh, retain a dominant uh, position in the oil market. Uh, so that's for them. They, they are in the position where their math or their, their uh, has to change. Now, what the, the third point that I would like to address is what are the implications for countries that are net importer of oil or the countries that rely, uh, that are not um, oil exporters and rely on uh, GCC oil or they rely on GCC support. So, historically speaking, the countries, these countries uh, have uh, typically faced an additional strain on their budgets uh, every time there is uh, a price boom in food commodities and in energy commodities. Uh, these strains were uh, um, obvious in their accounts and their budgets, but also it, it, it was not just an economic strain, but also a political strain in the street. Because of inflation, imported inflation, people start to feel the pains of higher food uh, commodities and higher oil prices, and it was obviously translated into uh, a political uh, discontent. Uh, and this represented a challenge to the, 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 the ailing social culture that existed in this country. Uh, the social culture that relied on, we're going to hire on the government, and we're going to give you subsidized commodities. But don't complain about the, the narrow space of political freedoms. So every time there's a boom in the, in the food and the oil prices, you have challenges and cracks in this social control. In my judgment, the peak of this crack and the peak of this challenge to the social contract was uh, at the dawn of 2011 and the start of the Arab uprising. Now, for these countries, the drop in the price of oil and the drop in the price of energy generally is an opportunity and a challenge at the same time. It is an opportunity because it gives them a chance to uh, breathe a bit, because definitely the, uh, the cost or the bill of energy imports will be reduced. So it kind of a way give them a chance to uh, slow down the, uh, the speed of very unpopular uh, reforms related to uh, prices of energy. So that's one possible opportunity. But it's also a challenge to them, because countries who support them, the GCCs, they will also, uh, whether they like it or not, will not be able to support them as much as they do because, uh, as I said, a 200 billion estimate and drop in surpluses, that's a lot of money. Uh, so, uh, at best, they will cease to support them in terms of grants or uh, in terms of uh, oil for free. But they would expect something in addition, obviously, to the political uh, cost of uh, supporting this country. They would expect that also an economic and financial return to their support. So, country.